One of the great privileges of working at History Hit and making films together with our team at Timeline is the access we get to extraordinary historical locations like this one, Stonehenge. I'm right in the middle of the stone circle now. It is an absolutely extraordinary place to visit. If you want to watch the documentary like the one we're producing here, go to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix for history. And if you use the code TIMELINE when you check out, you'll get a special introductory offer. See you there. In combat, the first thing to die is often the plan. And on this mission, things have gone wrong from the start. Hey, Albert, I got nothing. They're not moving anymore. These men are Canadian and American soldiers on a training exercise in Montana. They're here to learn how to fight like the first unit of Special Forces troops did back in 1942. The Army called those men the first Special Service Force but history remembers them as the Devil's Brigade. Summer, 1942. The Devil's Brigade arrives in Helena, Montana. The soldiers were a mixed group of Canadians and Americans. Some were outcasts from their regular units. Others had more ambition than brass button army life could satisfy. They didn't like the army. They didn't like officers. Uh, they, they didn't dislike our officers, don't get me wrong. They disliked officers that were, we called rear echelon officers. Within a few months, the training would turn the men into an aggressive hunter-killer unit who, in Churchill's words, would leave a trail of German corpses behind them. Oh, we scared the hell out of them. They were just scared of, were really scared of us. The basic weapon of the Devil's Brigade was designed by a Canadian, John Garand. In fact, the Garand M1 became the standard rifle of the U.S. Army. The Garand was widely considered the most effective infantry rifle of the Second World War. A semi-automatic .30-06 with eight rounds in the magazine. The clip ejected when the last round was fired. With a 24-inch barrel and weighing just over nine pounds, the Garand was deadly to a range of 3,000 meters. I liked the Garand very much. Uh, the idea of putting a clip of eight bullets into that rifle and squeezing the trigger eight times, but then it, after the eighth round was expelled, and, uh, the block would stay open and you had to load quick an another clip of ammunition to it and uh, start firing away again. The Mauser 98K was the German counterpart to the Garand. First adopted by the Wehrmacht in 1934, 14 million Mausers were used by the German army. The bolt action five round had a slower rate of fire than the Garand, but weighing just eight pounds, it was lighter and easier to clean. With an attachable high-powered scope, 
the Mauser became the weapon of choice for German snipers. Send it! Chris Bird is one of the best shots in the unit. Ready. Send it! Okay, left. Two right, uh, correction, two right. And give me three more up. The instructors think he has the potential to become a sniper. Ready? Send it! It would probably be a year or so before I would say anything because to recommend him forward. But if he maintained that, we got him out and did some more skill sets, um, got him to see how he handled situations, put a little stress on him, deprived of sleep, put him out for three or four days working, carrying and bouncing, just going different missions and just see how he handled the stress for about three, four, five days. If he handled that, he'd recommend it forward. Chris can hit a target on the range but he's never fired in combat. And a sniper must be willing to do the unthinkable and then do it again. Everybody will shoot once, but will they shoot a second and third time? Can they live with that fact? When we were taught, if you see a young child walking across a bridge at 10 o'clock in the morning and your orders are that no one should cross that bridge, what should you feel? And the answer, proper answer was recoil because no one crosses. Recoil. The men of the Devil's Brigade may not have agreed, but they would have understood. I think it was um, Eric Blair, you know, his opinion was George Orwell, right? He said that, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but we, we sleep soundly at night because rough men stand ready to do violence on our behalf. So that's, um, that, that's a key part of being a soldier. You have to be ready to, you have to, be ready to take another person's life. And of course, there's, there's nothing morally wrong with a soldier doing his job. Most of these soldiers have taken leave from their units to do this training. This is their vacation. They've come out of respect for the men who ran this course a lifetime ago. But they've also come to test themselves. Scott Young, a Canadian private from the Queen's York Rangers, has pushed himself too hard. I slid down the rope too fast. Well, I was, I was, I climbed up, right? And then I went down and I guess I went too fast and I didn't feel that, uh, I don't know, I didn't know that I was hurt until I was at the bottom. And yeah, I looked at my hand and it was bleeding all over the place, and, yeah. The brigade was ruthless in cutting men who missed training. Even a small injury like this meant a ticket home. Two months after pitching their first tent, 259 Canadian officers and men had been returned to their units, almost half their original number. Many went home on stretchers. Didn't matter who you were, if you had a broke, broke a leg or broke an arm or something, you were gone. Our commanding officer, Colonel McQueen, he was a great guy and uh, he made his first jump and broke his leg. Well, that was the end of him. By the time you would have healed, the training was gone. It was on to something else. Scott's injury means he too will miss training. So the instructors have decided to send him home. Yeah, it makes sense to me, but you know, it blows. Cause like, I was so stupid for doing that. Like, I don't know, I'm, I'm pissed right now. I just, such a bad man. Been in a bad mood since it happened. It sucks. It's very disappointed. I'm really disappointed that it happened in the first place. You know, if I could turn back time and change it, I definitely would, because it really hasn't, I don't know, it's really been a big disappointment. That's about it. So I don't know if I'm going to go get my other stuff, and I'll see you guys later. As the summer of 1943 wore on, the Devil's Brigade, created to destroy the Nazi heavy water project, a mission canceled at the last minute, spent its days keeping fit and doing public relations. Although the men had developed a strong affection for Helena, where many would settle after the war, explaining the flamethrower to housewives was not what they'd signed up for. Uh, and I, I'm sure that uh, our commanding officer was afraid that if he didn't find us something for us to do, we would, you know, we'd lose it. 
we'd, we'd lose the esprit de corps, we'd lose the desire, etc. He had, to, he had to find something for us to do. But matters would take a life of their own, courtesy of the Imperial Japanese Navy. Following their victory at Pearl Harbor, Japan expanded aggressively across the Pacific, sending occupation forces as far west as the Aleutian Islands off the coast of Alaska. As this Japanese newsreel shows, the next stop was San Francisco. These Japanese commandos were the first invaders to set foot on American soil since Canadians did in the War of 1812. The occupation of the Aleutians was a propaganda victory for Tokyo and a humiliation for Washington. The Devil's Brigade was ordered to get them back. Allied intelligence estimated as many as 12,000 Japanese troops held the main island of Kiska. With the memory of the bloody battle at Guadalcanal on their minds, the brigade expected a fight to the death. And uh, it, we, we, were, we were quite prepared that we would lose a lot of people if the Japanese put up the same kind of fight. At the spearhead of the invasion, the Devil's Brigade 1st Regiment led the assault in an armada of rubber boats, while the 2nd Regiment, the airborne unit, waited nervously. The 2nd Regiment was to make a parachute jump onto Kiska in support of the Seaborne landing. And I was in the 2nd Regiment, so we uh, prepared for the jump. We got on the planes around 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, waiting for the, for the dawn and the call to come. So we paddled ashore and, and, uh, in the dark. And strangely enough, just before we got to the, to the shore, the moon came out the first time we'd seen it in, in about two weeks uh, up there. And it, it displayed a, a whole lot of rubber, rubber boats if somebody was looking. We were really sitting ducks most of the time on the water. And on the way up, we passed a, a, a Japanese machine gun position, which had been vacated. And I thought as we went by it, thank God there isn't a Japanese machine gunner in there because we'd all be dead. The only enemy soldiers the men came across were casualties of the naval bombardment. After all those months of training, the Devil's Brigade took Kiska without firing a shot. The Japanese were gone, leaving still warm coffee and boxes of weather equipment. The call came that uh, the Japs had gone and we did not need to uh, make this jump, which was very good news because I pictured myself floating around in the cold Bering Sea. Once the beachhead had been secured, other units came ashore. Less well-trained and expecting to find an enemy behind every rock, they fired on themselves. That, uh, that first night after we were relieved, we, we had uh, pitched our pup tents and were trying to get to sleep and, uh, and we heard all this machine gun fire all night long and, and uh, you know, it was dark and foggy and, and these guys up above uh, that had taken over from us were, were uh, just uh, trigger happy. They were shooting their own people. I counted 13 corpses come down the next morning, but there were a lot more than that. 32 men died on Kiska, victims of friendly fire. The Devil's Brigade took no casualties, but lessons were learned. What I, uh, I took away from Kiska was that uh, no matter how careful the planning is, uh, you, there's always the unexpected. Although the unit was still not bloodied, the Kiska adventure served the men well. In the months to come, they would meet an enemy who would not cut and run, but would engage the brigade in some of the bloodiest combat of the Second World War. T-34 
10 days into training, and the squad has moved from the base to the bush. The instructors hope a few nights under the stars will help the team come together. So they've laid on a meal of Montana elk. There are two things guaranteed to get all soldiers talking, and one of them is food. My favorite meal was in, uh, it wasn't basic training, we already were in advanced infantry training. All I remember is it being, it was a little chilly, but it was just downpour. And we had eggs and everything, and it was great. But when your tray starts filling up with water and you try and eat it sitting under a tree shivering, that, that was about my best one. The best one I can think of is, it was in the field for us, but uh, it was in the home of, a, of, of an Afghanistan local. And uh, it, was, it was goat and rice and flatbread and tea. It was pretty good. I've also had goat at a different place, which was total opposite. Gamey, you know, disgusting. My hands smelled like goat for six days, no matter how much I washed them. <laughs> but this one time I went, they actually prepared it real nice with the, the spices and everything. It was, it was good. Living off the land is all part of Special Forces training. But for the men of the brigade, cooking bushmeat over an open fire was nothing special. They were looking for individuals that had experience being on their own under unfamiliar circumstances. For people who had outdoor experience, ranchers, trappers, prospectors, woodsmen, hard rock miners, they were looking for individualistic purse people who were outdoors people. These men are also tough soldiers. They can handle hard work. But soldiers need leadership, and in this group, leadership is lacking. Joe George is the only officer in the unit. Some of these things that we're learning are skills that aren't taught in a modern army. You know, we, 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 uh, we depend a lot on technology. We depend a lot on our, on our GPS, on our aircraft for, for insertions, on our Humvees for moving around. And uh, we don't spend a lot of time just out, light infantry on the ground, moving from one place to another. And I think that hurts us. Joe is a lieutenant in the National Guard who fought in Iraq before coming home to teach economics. The instructors are not sure he's the right man to lead the group. Jay Budd, however, has caught their eye. A third generation Green Beret Jay has no doubts he'd have made it in the force. Yes. Pretty confident about that, yes. Still a soldier, doesn't matter. Um, you know, if I'm a soldier in 2006 or 1942, I think it's in my blood to be a soldier. Yeah. Leadership was never an issue in the Devil's Brigade, as all the officers led from the front. Colonel Robert Frederick, the man who built the unit was wounded nine times. The officers did not hold their rank, nor did the NCOs, because of any service time or any pull or anything else. They all had to earn it. The officers went on the route marches with us, carried the packs, uh, got wet and cold, and still led from the front. Uh, like the obstacle course three times a day. <laughs> Tomorrow, these soldiers will face the most dangerous part of their training. They're going mountain climbing. To do it safely, they'll have to work together. A cliff face is no place for debate. The first special service force was trained to fight anytime, anywhere. And hanging from the side of a mountain was all part of preparing for the unexpected. They'd find us a nice, a nice cliff, and we had skilled instructors, uh, and we'd, we'd learn how to claw our way up and then belay down again. The mountain climbing actually was, was a little scarier to me than, than the uh, parachuting, uh, because you're, you're learning how to rappel down cliffs and, and climb places that didn't, didn't look like they could be climbed. Most of these soldiers do know how to climb, but none have climbed under fire. In the case of um, 
a unit this size, they're going to have to identify who's the best climbers uh, and who's got the strongest back to carry the supplies. And it, but that you're going to have to switch out those positions because that lead climber is going to get tired after a while. So everybody needs to know how to do this because you never know when you're going to be put in that position where you need to go up and you know scramble through the rocks. When the Devil's Brigade trained here, the men knew if they couldn't make it up cliffs like this, they were out. These soldiers are also climbing under pressure. The instructors have told them they'll cut any man who can't scale this face. Go, young blood. Good job. Good job, man. Woo. Rest is easy. <laughs> stick your hands in far and easy punch. is not a word Brian Haynes would choose. I have a very, very bad fear of heights. I don't know, it's just, you know, some people are afraid of spiders, some are afraid of snakes, some are afraid of heights. No, I'm sorry, as you were. Tension. Tension. Haynes is a drill sergeant in the U.S. Army who's Got been it. in many high-stress situations, but few like this. I feel like every time I move my feet, I feel like I'm going to fall. Tension. Every time I jump out of an airplane or rappel or climb, it's overcoming that fear of heights. That's part of the reason I have such a hard time climbing is committing myself to, you know, moving. It's very hard to move when you're afraid. Tension. Brian, Brian. Your right oh. rock, you're good. Hey, tension, I'm falling. I didn't like it. I, it frightened me. The climbing was, uh, the, the jump, parachute jumping never bothered me, but the rock climbing I found scary as hell. I could visual myself, visualize myself lying at the bottom of the hill with, uh, you know, with my head <laughs> split open. Tension. Tension. 60 feet up. Brian Haynes knows the feeling. There you go. How about that lens? Attention. Good job. Good job, bud. All right, Brian. Good job, big man. Woo! Good job. Nice one. I don't know what techniques I use to overcome my fear. I just do it. I just, you know, you just kind of reach down inside yourself and say, no matter what, I'm going forward. Assaulting a cliff face in wartime takes more than courage. It takes careful planning. Who carries the water, the extra ammo, the machine gun? How will the wounded get down? And where are the enemy sentries? They had uh, um, scouts, which they uh, relied on to go ahead and um, scout out the battlefield. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure that they identified their, the best climbers in the group, and they sent those people out as the lead climber. Chris Bird is everyone's choice for lead climber in this group. He's the type of soldier who'd have been at home in the brigade. Strong, agile, but most of all, Chris is fearless. It's actually the first time I've actually climbed uh, a rock or a face like this. Attention. The only other uh, practice or experience I've ever had was on a climbing wall in Regina, which is pretty flat terrain. In 1942, lead climbers had no second chances. Chris does. He has one small safety rope. I think most of the difficulty was in the, uh, the mental aspect of it, the idea of going up the hill with no protection immediately. Um, you mean so, the fear? Um, the concern. You, 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 you take your, your steps a little bit slower. You uh, make sure you tie the, the knots properly. Chris, Brian and the others all made it up this cliff. But most had to fight for every inch. When the brigade climbed here, each man carried his rifle, his water, and a 60-pound combat pack. I think it's part and parcel of the whole package, you know, the training package. It's kind of all integrated together. 
and the end product just comes out as a guy who'll, who'll do anything he's told to do and do it well. And part of that training were combat patrols like this. The soldiers have been ordered to scout a local bridge. But the bridge is defended by a unit of the National Guard familiar with these hills. And the squad is aware of the potential for an ambush. But these are experienced soldiers who've patrolled enemy territory before. They know the key to avoiding detection is in how you read the land. Well, this terrain, I don't think is any more or any less dangerous than other terrain. We've got good cover and concealment. The trees are giving us concealment as well as the thicker trees will give us cover. We are moving up ground or uphill. So we have the low ground, but it's relatively, relatively safe. We can go undetected, I think, for the most part. Special Forces missions are built on four principles. Planning, reconnaissance, assault, extraction. These rules are the same today as they were in 1942. Technology can provide an overview, but there is no better way to evaluate an enemy position than by putting human eyes on the target. Send a couple people left, right, forward, because we need as much eyes on as we can. And here we can see three quarters of the bridge, but not the first quarter. So we're going to send somebody on our left flank so they can observe at a better angle, and somebody on our right flank. So we're looking at composition of the bridge, size, dimensions, length, construction, that kind of thing, and if it's defended. The men survey the bridge without incident. Brian Haynes takes notes from which a sand table model will be built to plan the attack, and the squad withdraws. This patrol has gone well. They have been both skillful and lucky. Shooting from Bud is uh, in front of the sandbox. About... These soldiers all know their way around guns. Some have fired in combat. A few have killed. How many shots? Each man thinks he's the best shot in the unit. The instructors have decided to find out. They will test them. First up is the Green Beret, Jay Bud. Way high. The men will fire seven shots with their 45s from about 15 feet. Killing range. Good round. Next is a Canadian soldier, Scott Hollywood, who, as a Winnipeg police officer, carries a pistol every day. As I say, we, uh, we don't really train for groupings. We space them out, because if you hit a guy numerous times in one spot, all the trauma is in that area. So he doesn't know he's been shot. Well, he knows he's been shot, but he probably thinks he just got shot one time. Whereas if you space him out across the center of mass of his body, it's more trauma, more stopping power, because he realizes he's got multiple wounds in him, and he probably won't want to fight anymore. That one missed the target. 
loosen your grip and re-grip your right. There's oil all over the handle. That's as good an excuse as any. Look at that. That's <laughs> I think your buddy's got you on that one. Holy smokes. Next, Chris Bird, who's out to prove he's as handy with a pistol as he is with a rifle. Bird, you're a hell of a climber. You can't hit the broadside of a barn. That's better. Good job. Good job. Oh, man. Not good. <laughs> I think I'm the only one that hit the center, though. These are my first three that I pulled, and then these are my last four. And which one am I shooting at? You know, you're the one that says Albert on it. Which oh, right there. <laughs> Top left, Same. I think. You know, it's kind of a contrived situation, you know, in a, in a combative situation, you want a quick draw and put some rounds down range, try for two in the chest and one in the head. Joe George, the thinking man soldier, has found an advantage. He's realized there is no time limit between shots. You seem very focused. What are you thinking about when you squeeze that trigger? My next tour in Iraq. I think it's right with the last one. Oh, was it? Sweet. Yep. Yeah. That was... Okay, you're starting to breathe a little. Next time I go to Iraq, hopefully I'm the commander of Alpha Company 1st to 163rd Infantry. I'll be carrying a 9 mil. Damn good shooting there, Joe. Uh, one you threw up here. For Bill, I think there's an extra one in there. Either that or you missed all together. When I was looking, I think you put two right in here, so I actually think you got a third one there. Yeah, that's uh, that's not that's not bad. So good job, Joe. How's it look so far, Bill? <coughs> oh, average. Just average? Yeah. Nothing super? No. Bill Wolf. The hand-to-hand well, -hand combat super. instructor has gone along with his competition dark. reluctantly. He believes soldiers should be taught to shoot by instinct, to kill by reflex. Say it's not how you train soldiers. It's how you train people to die. Okay? Because you don't have that much time to stand and take a sight picture all day long. You're gonna have bullets coming at you, so you got to be quicker and you got to be more instinctual. What we did here is a target shoot, but it's not the way to survive in combat, all right? You all know that. Uh, we've talked about it. You did your instinctive shooting with pistols. That's the way you survive uh, a shootout. Uh, one of our best scorers here was the LT, or jo uh, George. It took you three minutes to fire off seven rounds. Probably. You know, three seconds is a lifetime in a firefight, okay? All right, guys, so uh, our, I guess our winners would be, who's the top dog there? Sergeant Wolf, did you decide out of this mess? LT. You the man, LT. Good job. Good job. Good job. LT, if you can do that in combat with bullets coming after you, I'll follow you anywhere. <laughs> Morale is crucial in any group of soldiers, and Joe's victory is met with humor and respect for outthinking them all. The bridge assault is on for tonight. 
Joe George has been given a chance to prove he can lead it. So our demo plan is, first of all, to crush or use cutting charges on the bridge on this span at this junction, this junction, here, and here. That will separate the top part of the bridge from this support. The team won't actually destroy anything, but they will have to overpower the sentries and plant dummy explosives on the trestles. When the brigade did this type of training in 1942, most of Montana knew the force meant business. We'd done, we, you know, we'd had intensive demolition training. We learned how to place charges, and uh, we also learned the use of, of TNT and the use of, of dynamite sticks. Their dynamite was soon replaced with a new and experimental explosive, RS. The RS, the the Ryan Special, which was long sticks of explosive. And it was joined by a product called Primacord, which was a, an explosive core. RS was a first generation plastic explosive, easy to use, hard to forget. When the men attack the bridge, they'll have to wire replica RS to the trestles. But the instructors have introduced a last minute twist. The squad will have just one hour to neutralize the sentries and plant the charges before a train crosses the ravine. If the train arrives before the explosives are in place, the mission will have failed. But tonight is to be a night of cross and double cross. These men are special force soldiers who rarely play by the rules. They've decided to do what the Devil's Brigade would have done, adapt. Afraid the instructors have tipped off the National Guard, the squad has begun the attack early. And Scott Hollywood, disguised as a jogger, has ambushed the National Guard sentries. I played Joe Jogger, freaking out what the hell's going on. When he turned his attention away from me, I drew my pistol from my back, uh, fired at him, took his weapon and his ammo, so now I got a little bit more firepower, and I linked up with my boys here. Got you now, Biatch. Fingers under there. Use, use rock. Clear. What do you got, Albert? Nothing. Okay, I got him. The men are only firing blanks, but their surprise has worked. The National Guard is beaten. Okay. Okay, so it's ready to go. The pin's already out of it. All you gotta do is pull it. is now fighting the clock. The one hour time limit is tight. So Joe's elaborate demolition plan is dropped in favor of simply getting the job done. Just getting these lined up, bro, whenever, whenever you're ready. I think 
gonna have some slippage. Got it. Up top, Charlie's gonna derail the train. Albert stayed up top. He lit that when the train was two minutes out, and uh, it was a one minute fuse. So to go off one minute before the train hits the rail, they'll have no time to stop. It's gonna derail. Let's go, let's go, now the go. charge is on the trestles. We're having a little bit of a problem with, but we still got them in in time. They're not as pretty as we'd hoped, but they're gonna work. And the fuses are burning on trestle three. We got a rigging. Where's Albert at? Devil three. All right, Albert. Let's go, Albert. Who's that? Joe. Joe, come on, come on. Go, go, go. Go. Gotta move. It's gonna go. go. Okay, no more. You guys go. Go, go. Spencer! No more, go. Where's Spencer? Let's go. Let's go. Come on. Guys. Come on, go. Spencer. No more talking. Go. Eight, nine, go. ten, eleven. Albert, you're twelve. Let's go. We're good. Come Come on, man. Let's go. I guess it would be going off like right now. So we're clear of the objective and uh, looking forward to a long march home. That's what it looks like anyway. Uh, not too bad. Uh, we had we had a couple machine gun nests that we were surprised by. So uh, Murphy kicked in kind of like I expected. But uh, but we still made the time. These men the are elite soldiers and them. their training kicked in. The mission was a success. The aftermath of combat is always the same, no matter time or place. Moments of reflection and a thankfulness that it's over. Some of these men have fought in firefights in Afghanistan or Iraq. And although tonight's battle was only a war game, no soldier likes to lose, especially not this squad, who are men of courage and men of honor, men determined to earn the respect of the Devil's Brigade. By the late summer of 1943, the Devil's Brigade had become a superb fighting unit. Colonel Frederick had done his job. But earlier in the year, the Devil's Brigade had been locked in purgatory without a mission of their own. So Frederick had done the one thing fighting men hate to do. He'd written a memo. Unless employment is found in the near future, the force should be discontinued. Frederick's memo had ricocheted from Washington to London, where it landed on Churchill's desk. Long a supporter of special operations, Churchill was not happy. He wrote, on no account dissipate the force. It may alter the whole strategic position of the war. To which Roosevelt himself responded, proceeding vigorously. Frederick's gamble had paid off. The Devil's Brigade was going to GI heaven. Our crew on a GI vacation arrives at an Air Force rest camp on the Italian seashore. Listen. The Air Force has always had it easy, or so the infantry says. America's newsreels made the Italian campaign seem like one long vacation. Fishing. Salute. Gurgle, gurgle, gurgle. Those with boots on the ground knew otherwise. Infantrymen of the 1st Special Service Force carry out a successful daylight raid on an advanced German position in the Anzio area. Men surround the German outpost in no man's land. This position is 400 yards in advance of the enemy lines. In the mud and blood of Italy, in a dozen battles over a hundred hilltops, the men of the Devil's Brigade would earn their medals and build their reputation. But they would pay a terrible price. And the fog lifted uh, a minute, and uh, there was nothing but bodies around which hadn't even been able to remove them. Well, going past those dead guys was, uh, I think, the sobering moment for everybody. Then is when you start realizing, hey, that could be me. 
Yeah, I sort of went this way and he went that way. I knew he was dead. Guy gets hit with a close mortar bomb in the open. You don't need to look for a pulse. Next time on Devil's Brigade, Anzio, the brigade goes into action. What are all those things coming in? They said, those are shells from the Germans. Ooh, I volunteered for this? These were the helmet that they apparently issued. And the squad takes parachute training, Devil's Brigade style. So we got up in this damn C-47, and the guy said, stand up, hook up, stand in the door. Out we went. Getting to the door, that was the big scare. You know, that, that's where I got the serious butterflies. Jump or go home. That's next time on Devil's Brigade.